Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending July 1st. I asked for comments, especially from many pilots, about my last week's TDD report when they were uh, talking about how difficult it was for airplanes to fly and why they had to, uh, in high temperatures, and why they had to stop flights when it reached a certain temperature. And I was, in my uneducated, just basic guessing way, um, thinking that there might be problems with uh, other things other than the air density. Uh, evidently not. Evidently the other components are not really the problem. It is basically the air density. And I'm going to share what two pilots uh, told me here. Uh, first, my friend Andrew R., who flies for Qantas. Um, yep, that's right. It's called density altitude. There was also runway length, tire speed certification, engine thrust considerations, and then my friend Matt J., who's a CRJ pilot, that's the uh, Bombardier Airlines from uh, those airplanes are made in Canada. Uh, while you're correct that high temperatures do have an effect on aircraft systems and takeoff performance, it's not the reason the CRJs can't fly when it's hot and before takeoff. Airline crews must prove they can take off safely using charts that take into consideration things like runway length, aircraft weight, and temperature. When Bombardier created the takeoff performance charts for the CRJ, the charts had a maximum temperature of standard plus 35 centigrade, which I don't know, you guys are going to have to um, convert that for me um, in your own heads, but whatever 35 centigrade is in Fahrenheit. Since standard temperature is roughly 14 C in Phoenix, this means that when temperatures exceed 49 C, ah, here he goes, 120 F, CRJ pilots can no longer prove they have the ability to safely to take off safely and therefore can't depart. So thank you, Matt and Andrew, for that response. I really appreciate it. And the next two articles come from my friend Tom, who has uh, been sending in a lot of stuff on a real regular basis. This is... Uh, um, Laser weapons, this is from army.mil. Laser weapons bring sharp advantages to the battlefield. And I like this because they show, I'll put the picture up here, a briefcase with different materials. And you can see there are different kinds of metals. And even it looks like on the top there, there's a piece of a, some kind of a drone, maybe a DJI Phantom or something like that. And all these things look like they got hit pretty uh, destructively by a laser. But I'll just read the first part. And as usual, all the links to the articles, which uh, today will be two articles, um, all the links will be below in the description. The Army and Navy are increasingly incorporating laser weapons on a limited number of platforms and training exercises, according to Matthew Kettner, Branch Chief of the High Energy Laser Controls and Integration Directorate at the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Dahlgren Division, Virginia. Boy, that's a mouthful. Kettner spoke on these emerging laser technologies spoke last month during Lab Day at the Pentagon. For its part, the Navy placed a 30-kilowatt laser aboard the USS Ponce, an amphibious transport dock ship in 2014. The, labor, the, the, labor, the laser has been tested extensively and is authorized for defensive use. So, uh, yeah, um, they talk about later on in the article about the fact that the thing, uh, obviously a laser is just basically point and shoot. There's no trajectory or, or curve like you do with a actual... Uh, bullet or a missile or anything like that. There's no worrying about wherever you point it. It's just straight as light because it is light. And uh, the other thing about it too is they said there are some disadvantages. It doesn't have all the advantages even though it can do some great things. Uh, one downside he noted is that lasers take a lot of energy and have difficulty penetrating haze, dust, smoke, and materials with anti-laser coatings. So yeah, mirror reflective type of surfaces probably would be protective and I wonder if a lot of, especially in the case of uh, drones, if they were uh, large enough and could carry enough payload, I imagine they would have some type of smoke event emitting device to uh, challenge the laser in the future if that should become a problem with whoever operates the drones uh, in enemy territory. I'm, I'm sure, as a matter of fact, I'm sure our military already probably has those things in place um, to go because they're, you know, if we can do it, the bad guys can eventually do it too, even if we're ahead of the game. So. And this next one is for from space.com, also from Tom. Farewell, Rosa Space Station. Let's go of rollout solar array after retraction fail. Yeah, they've been trying. They, they had a different type of folding uh, solar panels to try them out to save space, different space-saving ways. And this uh, rollout solar array called Rosa um, was safely, safely jet, jettisoned. Uh, by uh, It was put out by the space station's robotic arm. But for some reason, they weren't able to get it to retract properly. So basically, they gave up on it and just jettisoned it. So it's probably going to uh, maybe uh, eventually go out of orbit and tumble down and uh, you know burn up and uh, re-entry. So 
Uh, it says here, once Jettison Rosa will not present any risk to the International Space Station and will not impact any upcoming visiting vehicle traffic, they added. It has been retracted successfully. Rosa would, if, if it had been retracted successfully, Rosa would have been stowed in the trunk of the SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft, which departs the station in a week, but it still wouldn't have made it back to Earth. Dragon's trunk will be detached and burn up in Earth's atmosphere as the cargo spacecraft returns. So, yeah, they were not, um, it was not like it was going to go back to Earth to be examined or anything like that. So, um, not really a huge, huge loss as far as the experiment's going, but yeah, now is the time to test out all these things, especially before we do things like maybe uh, set up a moon base, go to Mars, something like that. We want to have these panels be able to fold up into the smallest package possible and be as lightweight as possible, but still uh, function fully, you know, be able to uh, not just expand out, but to be able to retract properly. So anyway, that's about it for uh, this week. Uh, thank you, Tom, for sending in the stuff, and I would encourage everybody else to. Uh, if you send stuff in and I don't use it right away, don't get disheartened about it. it. Just Sometimes I'm saving up stuff for different subjects, too. I've had uh, some shows where people have sent me stuff about robotics and stuff like that, and maybe two or three weeks in the future I have uh, scheduled a TDD report on robotics. So I'll be, if you say, if you sent something like that and I had a show scheduled in the future, I wouldn't necessarily do it right away. I would do it when the subject uh, kind of came together and everything. So I do appreciate what everybody sends, and I do uh, read it all. So take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.